Hey y'all, welcome to podcast episode number seven. This is your girl Tanetta and this is the podcast Taboo Conversations. And it will be a lot of taboo conversations in this particular episode, just to let y'all know. I got um, four things to talk to you all about and then I'll get into the topic for the um, for this actual episode, which I'm not sure what it's going to be. It's a different little process and I'll explain that to y'all as I go along. But I just want to give y'all kind of a recap of my, I guess last week and a half, two weeks since I last did the last episode. For one, y'all, I did a thing. Yes, 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 your girl did a thing. I um, went and got my first newer car, I guess I put it that way. It's actually a 2017 Volkswagen. I forgot the other name of it, but it is a 2017 Volkswagen. It's my favorite color, it's blue. Um, I got that car about two Saturdays ago. Um, I've never in my life even had a car note. But my old trusty Trailblazer, I think I told y'all about that in the last episode. I had that car towed home. Let me see, three times in July. It actually broke down four times. The fourth time I actually managed to get home because I was around the corner. I got home and like the, it's, it, some light came on called low pressure sensor, low low pressure mode or something, whatever it was. I had to drive the car home like that in like 10 miles an hour because it kept cutting off and this kind of thing and the car is still sitting outside. The same place I parked it a few weeks, several weeks ago. But like I said, I had to go ahead and get another a newer car, a better car that's going to run right, run better, and going to get me to point A to point B without having to, of course, having to have it towed every every other week and this kind of thing. Like I said, y'all, that Trailblazer lasted me, what, three years, I guess? I bought it used, of course, it's a 2002. That was the newest car I had ever had, actually. But like I said, I definitely bought it um, bought, bought used, and I didn't really have to have much work done to it, but the last, like, month and a half... It seems like all types of stuff was going wrong. First, it was the water pump. We had to have it replaced twice. And I think I told y'all that that little crazy um, situation in the last episode. But when I replaced the water pump the first time, I'll, just in case y'all didn't hear it, the second time, well, we had to have it replaced the second time. O'Reilly's sold us a defective part. Um, I tried to take the old one back, the one that we had just gotten from them about a week or two prior. And the man's telling me, oh, this is a used one. He didn't even look at the damn water pump, actually. And I was just pissed off. Like I told him, I don't give a fuck about that. I'll just buy a goddamn another one. I'll just call y'all corporate office because this came from the store. Just run the serial numbers on there. All my partner, whoever else is lying to me and we didn't get, they didn't get it from there. He bought a used one and he just lied to you. Sit. All this old stupid ass shit. And I'm sort of like, motherfucker, look. I know what the fuck he bought. It's my goddamn car. I know what the fuck he bought. He showed me the goddamn stuff. I had the box and receipt in the back. I threw the shit in the trash. I'm like, are you, are you serious? And I know that all parts, all car parts have serial numbers that they can match up. He didn't even look at the part. He didn't look at anything he can look right at that water pump and tell that it was brand new still and it was their defective part but that like i said that was okay i was so pissed off i'm like you fucking i mean are, are you serious like i told him just i'll buy another water pump that's fine i contacted the corporate office still have not heard anything from the court i guess heard any kind of apology anything whether i can get my money back i'm just not going to mess with that car part store anymore i guess i put it that way as long as i can help it actually i can't help it because my new car has a warranty for what ninety thousand miles bumper to bumper five years all that kind of stuff so i can just take it back to the car shop where i got it from or take it to the volkswagen dealer so i don't have to even worry about that anymore but like i said y'all i was so pissed off i'm sitting up here like how you gonna tell me when my partner my and then the mechanic i've used for like 20 something years are lying to me they went to the junkyard and got it uh or used one and just took your money nobody took anything i know exactly what he bought i'm like i'm not fucking stupid but like i said there was a whole situation i just, I just said forget it i'm not going to even support their store anymore do anything with their store or even recommend their store to anybody and as you all know well you all may not actually know but i am a google local guy here in the st louis area and i'm one of i was the top three percent i think somebody has knocked me down to like the seven or eight percent now but that's okay i'm getting back in it so that's all right but like i said i'm definitely am not i'm going to give them a bad review i'm definitely not recommending their their store to anybody else i guess i put it that way because of the experience that i had it just i mean for somebody to come off and say all those types of things and not even look at the car part that was in the box or that I brought back up there, I guess I put it that way, not even want to run the serial numbers, just telling me that they all lying to me and all these kind of things, that particular person should not even be, should not even be working at a store, or if he's working at a store, because it was a guy, a black guy actually, um, they need to train this man some more on, on how to speak to customers and how to actually go by returning a fucking part, is, is how I look at that. But like I said, I'm not even worrying about that anymore, I was so upset at the time, because it was ridiculous. I'm like, this person's telling me what somebody's done. They're lying to me, and they went and got this. I'm like, I saw the receipt. I saw, I looked at the motor. I mean, I know how it looks. I know how the one I had, and it was dirty and all crazy looking. 
I had the box in the back seat. Yes, it was my fault that I threw all this stuff in the trash, thinking that this part was going to be okay. I waited maybe like a week, and I threw it in the trash, and then here come my, like, like the following week, it started messing up. It started leaking again, doing the same exact thing. That's why I had to go get another one, but I bought the other one. I didn't even, it was only $50. I'm not even going to worry about it. Like I said, I'm just not recommending their store to nobody else. Of course, folks are still going to go buy it and stuff like that, but I don't care, but I know I won't be going there or nobody that I will. I can't say nobody else that I know they can go if they want, but like I said, dealing with that kind of store, and I know it was just that person. I understand that, but they need to hire better staff that, that know how to handle customers and that know how to, of course, find the serial number. Like I told him, I've, I've done this at AutoZone, different places. I'm not one who steals and lies, and neither is my partner. So I'm like, okay, what in the world? This is the first time I'd ever encountered that. When I went to Napa, I've been to AutoZone, but all these other places, they ran the serial numbers on the park because they're actually usually like on the bottom of it. Uh, um, and they have like all these numbers and letters and that kind of thing that you can look up and verify that it was, it was found, I mean, bought from your store. And then, of course, my partner sent me the Bank of America, his, his receipt, because I couldn't find the original receipt that actually where he purchased the the item from that store at the time, the location, and the person that, that, that actually was at the register. And I'm like, this is crazy. You won't take it back after this? I'm just like, what in the world? But like I said, that's my last time dealing with that store, my partners as well. So moving on to the next thing. Like I said, I did get a new car. So now I don't even have to worry about all those kind of things. My cars cover bumper to bumper for the next five years unless I drive 90,000 more miles. But I shouldn't, y'all. I'm pretty sure of that. And the car, like I said, it has also, it still has some of the original warranty on it. I think it has, my, when I bought the car, I think it was like at 30 some thousand miles. It wasn't like a whole lot of miles for 2017. So I think I have like 60 more, 60, um, what is it? Until like 60,000 miles on that car now. But then any, anything after that, that, that's when the other warranty kicks in. So like I said, everything is covered for at least the next five to six years with this particular vehicle. Bumper to bumper, I even got the tire protection plan. If I have a blowout, that kind of thing, I can just go and get one and or they can come and service it. Give me a rental until it's fixed and all that kind of stuff. So so that's awesome, y'all. So moving on to the next thing. But like I said, your girl did a thing. I got my first car note. I was very, very nervous. Actually, I'll just tell y'all this. I was very, very nervous about getting my first car note because I had never had one at all ever in my life and I never actually wanted one. I just don't see the point of getting in debt more, trying to have a vehicle, but now I understand that when your vehicles are down, of course, which we had both of our trucks down, his was down since last year, we tried to make it work with the one, and then mine was down with most of July, we were catching Ubers back and forth, he and I back to work, it was almost $100 a day, y'all, to catch some damn Ubers. Like I said, now I realize that it's not really a waste of money. It's just as long as you have the money to pay for the car and that kind of thing. As long as you're not trying to get not just get over on people and not have it paid for and get a repo, which other folks had talked about that and how it has it, how expensive it is. And so I'm like, okay, I'm listening listen to what they're saying in the past and not even going for myself to figure out what's going on with a new car or newer car, how it works, that kind of thing. Like I said, that was on me, y'all. That was a lesson that I had to learn in the last two weeks, I guess I put it that way. Like I said, I've learned that lesson. I've moved on, so now I know that process. So I'm not even, like I said, having any fears or anything at all going back to another car lot. To, once I want to buy something else or trade it in, or however I want to do it. But like I said, like I said, that, that, that's, the, that's the biggest lesson that I learned when it's coming to a new car. And also, not just that, but just listen to what other folks say. We have to realize that at some point, of course, people can say all these kind of things of what their experience were. We can't live out their same experiences because we have no idea what's going on in their lives, y'all. Just remember that. And like I said, that's what I did with this particular car situation. Not wanting to get a new car because I had a car no hearing all these things that folks said. Oh, it can get repoed. It can get this. It can get that. The insurance is going to be expensive and all these kind of things. And um, out just just all these kind of things that you hear from or I heard from black folks growing up and in the past and that kind of thing But like I said, I had to take it upon myself to go experience this for myself for the first time And like I said, that was something that I had never done and like I said, I know the process I'm no longer scared of that and it's not just the fear It was just me listening to what other folks had fed into me I guess I put it that way over the years and I didn't even realize that it was even going on with this car I didn't even realize that until I like I said, got to the car lot on my way going, was nervous, that kind of thing. And I'm like, why the hell am I so scared? But I had, to, I had to think back to all these kind of things that folks, of course, have been telling me throughout the years. And what I saw happen to them, their car got repossessed or whatever was going on. I've seen those things with other folks. But like I said, me, I'm one that always has bills paid. Everything is always up to date. Nothing has ever um, been cut off or repo. I've never had anything repo, any, anything like that. I've never had any, any, any um. Issues paying a bill. I'm always paying them every single month. I don't care what. Well, 
every bill that I have, I ain't gonna say I don't care what it is, but every single bill that I have is always paid, it's always up to date. I never owe anything. Sometimes, of course, I forget the damn bill, forget the forget the damn due date. And of course, like a few days later, or a week later, I'm like, oh my God, I forgot. And go ahead and pay, pay, pay the whole thing then, including the late fees. But like I said, I've never had an issue with anything being cut off or me being, um, uh, not, not ignorant, what's the word? Me being, um, not knowing how to manage my money. I've always been very good with finances. That has been something that I've always been good at. And like I said, I've never had those issues. And I know the folks that may have taught, told me those things in the past about car notes and repos and all that kind of stuff, they may have had those problems, which it kind of showed, I guess I put it that way. And like I said, I had to realize with this whole process that no matter what anybody else have been through I'm not that same person as them and I'm not in the same situation as them so I had to do my own thing I guess I put it that way and I can't rely on somebody else's word I had to find out for myself and like I said that's what this whole car situation gave me I guess I put it that way and a new car of course of course but let me move on to to to, to the next I'm now I'm stuttering I'm all excited <laughs> but let me move on to the next thing y'all I think I told y'all in the last episode as well that I had a new course coming out called Pillow Talk Pleasure Conversations, and I did do that launch. It was the last week of, well, it was actually combined with the last week of July and then the first uh, week of August, actually, um, but it was definitely a failed launch. I got no sales, of course. I'm just like, oh my God, I don't know what happened. Like I said, I was trying to do my best as far because this is my first time actually ever launching a course or anything along these lines. So I was trying to do the best I could and from all the stuff that I've, of course, read and the things I've looked at and the trainings that I've had and the coaches, it's like the, the, the courses I bought from other coaches and stuff like that. But I had no sales, y'all. I heard crickets the whole entire time. So I'm like, okay, so there, therefore something I did, I mean, I'm not sure, I, I, I've written stuff down to kind of figure out what I did wrong. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't have money to pay five, ten thousand dollars a month to pay for coaches or whoever else. So right now I'm doing this all on my own. I guess I put it that way. Um, I do have another. Well, of course, I mean, I, I have a launch book that I um, read maybe set back earlier this year, actually. And I should have probably went back and read those steps in that launch, which I did not. But that's OK. But like I said, I definitely know from this launch that I know I need to grow my email list. I know that. And I was trying to do that throughout this. But I know that I have to come up with other freebies. I guess I put it that way. And just not, not and not I guess not just the freebies, but I guess other courses, other information to, of course, provide for free to my customers and that kind of thing, or potential customers, I guess I put it that way. But like I said, I definitely got crickets, y'all. Like I said, that's my first time ever launching anything, I guess I put it well, a course, the, um, the Bedroom Candy, I launched that back several months ago. It did, I had got one sale, I think, out of that. And like I said, it's not really that it was the sale, it just it seems like the information that I was putting out either wasn't needed or nobody was interested in, I guess I put it that way. That's what it seemed to me. And like I said, I know I had a big idea about this pillow talk and people, because I saw some different, um, like different posts that I had made and different posts that I saw others make as well. Folks were talking about how it was so hard for them to talk to their partner in the bedroom and do all these things and have, I guess, talk about sex and all this kind of thing. So I'm like, okay, I can make a course out of that if that's the case. I mean, it was on my post as well, several posts of mine, actually, and several videos that I had done. And people were just asking questions about it. How do I talk to my partner about this? How do I tell? So I tried to create something that I thought people would need, but I guess they didn't need it, I guess. But unless I did not market it in the right way and getting on to marketing. I'm reading, I, I, I've been reading this whole entire year, actually since late last year, trying to, because I have no background in marketing, sales, business, anything along those lines. Yes, I had a cake business uh, several years ago and I did gift baskets and candy bouquets and stuff like that. Those were actually physical products. Yes, I did those. I sold some of those. It wasn't like I was doing a thousand a day, anything like that. No, I wasn't. Not even a thousand a month. And like I said, I know that I've always been lacking those skills. And like I said, I've been trying to educate myself as much as possible in reading marketing books, sales books, and also listening to them as well, audio books and that kind of thing as well. But also, of course, following up and make sure that I'm, of course, um, putting the action behind the things that I'm, that I'm, of course, hearing. And of course, like I said, the last six, seven, what is this, August? So I guess almost nine, ten months, but I guess maybe like since like December, I'd say December last year, because I have no idea how many months it's been. At least this whole entire year of 2021, I've been learning, trying to learn these skills. Because like I said, I have nobody in my family that ever had a legal business that had any type of, that I've ever seen, I guess. I don't know. I guess growing up and that kind of thing, my parents didn't have a business. Nobody that was close to me had a business. So I have no skills besides of what I see other folks doing um, online or on TV. That's the only thing I really can, I guess, can 
can, can relate things to, I guess I put it that way. Yes, I've seen those. Yes, I've studied it, that kind of thing. But it's totally different from when you're, of course, doing your own business, I guess I put it that way. I'm an employee, so of course I have, a, well, some folks say it's employee mindset. I doubt that's what that is. It's just learning the fucking skills that you need as far as marketing, selling your own products. It has nothing to do with, at least for me, a mindset. Others it may, yes, but I know you can switch things from business to employee. I know that in a matter of minutes, at least for me, I can. Can't speak for everybody else, but like I said, for me, I definitely can. I've never had any problem with the changes or doing anything like that. My problem is that I do not know marketing. I don't know sales. I don't know how to, of course, it seems to me, talk about the benefits of the product correctly, I guess, put it that way. Or I might, something I might do, and I'm not even sure what it is, but that's what it seems to me. And like I said, with, with learning all these things and trying to figure out what's going on, like I said, it definitely was a failed launch, but that's okay. So I'm, I'm going to do it again. I guess I put it that way as well. And also, like I said, incorporate some of the things that I'm learning as well in this new marketing book that I'm reading. And like I said, I'm definitely going to go back to that launch book. It was the um, some kind of big giant, well, not big giant, but whoever, I, I forgot the man's name. I don't remember because I read the book back in January or February of this year. Um, but it was a book about launching, and this particular guy, I have it in my phone, actually, because I had to download the book. This particular guy is like the father of launching businesses and courses and all this kind of stuff, and that's the book that I chose to read because um, I heard another coach talking about it, and that's what they use, and that's what they fell back on, and that's how they learned their business. So I'm like, okay, I, they, they can learn their business and how, they, how to sell. They're making millions for what they say. I can try to figure out this as well, find this book, and go ahead and start reading it myself. And like I said, as I was reading that book, and I wish I had the name of the book, I should have probably wrote it down before I got on here, but that's okay. I will find it. Because like I said, it's definitely in my phone. But like I said, reading through this book, and I'm sitting up like this is exactly what this person, actually several coaches that I follow and talk to and have gotten courses from and been on workshops with are doing the exact same thing this man was saying. And like I said, I didn't follow, I guess, whatever rules it was. So I have to go back and redo this launch. And actually, I guess all the courses that, will, that I'm wanting to launch or anything else that I'm wanting to launch, I guess I put it that way. I know I have to go back and read this particular book at least the steps to it again to make sure that I write them down and have them in my notebook so I can reference them every single day so I can know what I need to do for my next launch I was trying to launch a, a course or something course ebook something every single month on the first it may not be on the first every single month but it will be like within like the first week I guess I would say that it'll be something like I said I have to get in the mode of launching and trying to figure out this process and that kind of thing I believe um I know on that book, he did his in seven days, I guess, because, well, some folks say you need 45 to 90 days and that kind of thing to get folks prepared for it or ready for it. But this guy, I think he did his in about a month, like talking about the information, that kind of thing. But then seven days or five days, whatever it was, he had, he had did his launch process. And of course, he makes millions, I'm sure. I, I think he's still alive, I want to say. Uh, but like I said, I definitely have to go back and reread that particular, all those sections in that book so I can make sure that I write them down somewhere so I can reference them every single day or at least every single week so I can know exactly what I'm looking at and know, know exactly what I need to be doing during these launch days, I guess I put it that way. And knowing how to, like I said, how to, of course, explain the benefits. I know how to explain, of course, how the course works or how it should go, how you should study it, all those kind of things. And I'm assuming that's not what, what folks wanted to hear. So, of course, I was trying to do like some evening, uh, my own pillow talks, of course, talking about my own pillow talk experiences and that kind of thing. And, and my own relationships, actually, is what I was talking about. I was telling, of course, my story about my, my pillow talk that I had or did not have the first time I had sex and in my marriage and all those types of things. I guess that wasn't what folks want to hear either. I don't know. Like I said, my page, it seems like, because, of course, it's Speak Your Truth, of course, sponsors this podcast. And that's, of course, my relationship coaching business. And so does Bedroom Candy, because I'm, I'm a Bedroom Candy Boutique Consultant. And I haven't talked about that a lot lately, because I'm trying to focus on my own business to make sure I'm getting that to grow and figuring out what's going on and figuring out how to market, sell, all that type of thing. But like I said, definitely that sponsored this podcast as well. And like I said, just knowing that this was just failed, I, I was so pissed off. I, th I, I don't think I cried about it, but like I said, I was very upset about it. So I'm like, okay, I put all this into this launch and trying to figure out what's going on. And all I get is crickets. I'm like, okay, what the hell is going on? I'm telling my story. I'm, I mean, I, maybe it's because I don't have social proof yet. I am new to this. I don't have, didn't have anybody to take the course yet, that kind of thing. But I know I do need to have, I, ha I have to do some type of beta testing group. I know that. That's going to be taking place soon as well. And I can't say it, it was just because there's a lot of folks who sell stuff that have no, that have no proof that, that things actually worked. But either I have the wrong, I've targeted the wrong people. 
and that's not what they wanted to hear, or I made the wrong product and it's just not like I said, either. I guess that, that's the same thing. Either targeted the wrong people or have the wrong product. That's the only thing that could be going on with this failed launch. I guess I put it that way. Like I said, the benefits, I, I am learning how to, of course, write out more of those benefits and talk about those benefits and that kind of thing, which I did try to include some of those in this, in this launch. But like I said, it just seems like I'm noticing with this, with my coaching business, I love doing videos. As you see me, of course, I'm doing this podcast. I love to talk. I love to do videos and that kind of thing. It just seems like the people that's, of course, in my group and in my um, community are not really wanting to or, or care about any videos that I do. I put it that way. I do videos at least like several times a week, actually. And I'm like, okay, they don't, they don't even like the post or like the videos or anything. They don't like the, um, what is it called? The quotes and the, like, like the, the, I guess like the written stuff that I do. So I'm like, okay, this is the, at least to me, it's the strangest thing. When I had my group speaker, Truth Community, I was doing videos and there are a lot too. I mean, I had people, of course, looking at the videos. We were talking back and forth and that kind of thing. But it seems like when I, cause I closed my group back in like mid June, actually, because it was so hard to run the group and the page as well as the same business. I'm doing the exact same thing, sometimes posting the same things on the same days. One of those had to go. It was just too much to do, do, do doing the same thing twice every single day. And every single time that I'm making my posting calendar and stuff like that. So I said one of those had to go. So I got rid of the group and I kept my actual page over on Facebook, the actual Speaker Truth um, um, business page or whatever you want to call it, fan page. And like I said, I'm just like, okay, now what's going on? Because some of those folks that was in the group, actually a lot of them are actually on this page as well. And I'm like, okay, nobody wants to see the videos. What's going on? Am I doing something wrong with the video? Which I doubt it. But like I said, I think either I have the wrong people or I don't, or they don't want to hear what I have to talk about. Well, it's actually along the same lines as the quotes that I have on the page. It's the same exact similar information. It's just given, I guess, like I said, my experiences or lessons or those of others when it came to relationships or things I've seen on TV or talking about different things. Hold on, y'all. Alexa, turn off. This Alexa just came on to interrupt my podcast, y'all. The dog on the lawn. That's not even my lawn. Getting back to the podcast. But like I said, definitely, definitely, um, like I said, I have to figure out. Because like I said, I love to talk and I love to, of course, be on video. And then, which I know that's kind of probably odd and strange for some. But some are very scared to get on video and talk and do all these things. I have no problem with that. But like I said, I definitely have to figure out whether it's something I'm, I mean, I don't know what's going on. Cause I got on the written post and the, and the little quotes that I make and that kind of thing. I guess shit, well, they share those, they like those. And sometimes they comment and, um, at least throughout the day and that kind of thing. And I'm like, okay, when I go do a video, it's like, I get like nothing. And I'm like, okay, what is going on? So like I said, I have to figure out what's going on, even if this business is even for me or if I'm, we have the wrong people on the page or I'm talking about stuff that they don't want to hear about, which I don't think that's the case. Because I know I see other relationship coaches talking about the same thing and are similar things about relationships and ending the relationship or breaking up and getting back together, all these kind of things, I guess, cheating and all these types of things I talk about. The communication piece and how to talk to your partner, how to be respectful of your partner, how to talk about your needs. And I talk about all those things, intimacy and all those types of things. So I'm like, I doubt that it's the information. Either it's, like I said, the, I have the wrong set of people, I guess I put it that way. Are they don't are there? Uh, it seems like they were interested, of course, in the information. They liked the page and they came to the page. I guess I put it that way, which they didn't have to. But like I said, they all did. I mean, there was like almost 700 followers, and I forgot, and four, four or 500 or something likes or whatever it is to the page. And I'm like, okay, either you didn't, you wanted to come to the page, I guess. I'm mean, not enforcing anybody to come. So, like I said, either it's, either it's just the wrong set of people, I guess I put it that way. Or it's not what they want to talk about, I guess I put it that way. Or it's not what, they, well, I guess I can't say, like I said, I just said that. Like I said, I can't say that because they, cause they like everything else except for the videos, it seems like. Or am I coming across, in, in a, well, which I didn't have any problem with it I'm on my other page, my regular Tanetta Clay Facebook page. You all can find me there as well. I always have folks in my videos. They're talking about the same, similar, not similar, because it's more about, like I said, experiences, lessons. Um, that kind of thing that I've been through just teaching others, of course, from my experience and that kind of thing as well. That's what everybody else does. And I've seen everybody else do the same thing. And like I said, it wasn't a problem at all in the past. I was talking all the time, doing videos and that kind of thing. I have no idea what's going on. Either this business is for me or it's not. Like I said, I have to decide that I have the wrong people or I don't have. I mean, I, I have the right people. I don't know yet. Like I said, I'll keep doing this business for a little bit longer and see what's going on. I'm not going to just close it right away, that kind of thing at all, but just getting into my next thing.
As I'm reading all this marketing information, sales information, business information, all these books and teaching myself all this stuff. And I've heard all these coaches and they're not just coaches, but other business owners do these same exact things or talk about these same exact things. So I know I'm on the right track, but I'm actually starting to love that a hell of a lot more than the relationship coaching, actually. I know that's a hell of a thing for me to say, but like I said, I'm realizing that a lot more and more lately. I'm reading a book right now talking about um, guerrilla marketing. I'm loving that, y'all, because y'all may not, none of y'all may, may even know, but I've always loved events. I have been putting on events. I love events, y'all. That's one thing that I've always loved and I want to incorporate into this relationship coaching business as well with the couples. Um, but I haven't figured out quite how to do that because I know some of the couples are different places across the world, that kind of thing, in my city as well. I'll figure that out if this business is going to stay going. But like I said, I'm definitely interested in the marketing, this guerrilla marketing and marketing trying to help. Because I know the only, actually, let me, let, let me tell y'all this. For the past several years, now, of course, I had I had I had a relationship blog with this same name called Taboo Conversations, and it's over on Facebook. I had that blog for about four and a half, five years actually, and of course, I was doing that before I even started the business, the coaching business actually. But like I said, throughout these last several years, I haven't had anybody. Well, I had a few people, maybe like one hand, one or two approach. Well, no, not 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 one or two. Probably about four, no more than five. I guess I put it that way approach me about relationships and that kind of thing. Yes, I had folks commenting, um, but not like personally reaching out to me to, of course, get the assistance. I guess I put it that way. But I have had a lot of people reaching out for business assistance, actually, in the last several years. I'm like, okay, I was helping, I, I was helping two people, of course, do their startup business. Um, one wanted a homeless shelter in the St. Louis area um, and, and, um, and um, like resources and that kind of thing program for the homeless here in the city and that kind of city and county, I believe. The other one had a re business like giving out resources and, of course, talking to the families, the communities and things like that. And was needing some more assistance on trying to how to get her business out there and that kind of thing. I've had folks approach me with the real estate that me and my partner are doing. Cause I, of course, I've, I've done a few classes or just workshop or, or just like little videos just about wholesaling and that kind of thing and how I got started. And I had some folks reach out. Actually, two people reach out to me for that in the last few months to teach them how to set up a business. I'm sitting up here like, well, what the hell? Maybe I need to go to the damn business side because I'm like, that's all I've been getting actually for the last several years. I've had folks to reach out because I'm very, very good with ideas and brainstorming and just coming up with a whole lot of like different like business topics, actually, not just topics, but business ideas on what somebody can do. I've always been good with that as well, even though I had no background in business, but I knew I was a creative. I'm all, I have always been creative. Yeah, creative. Like I said, I've, I've started all types of businesses and did all types of things, even though that may not have been the right thing at the right time. That's OK. I'm learning that and I'm seeing that now. But like I said, folks have always reached out about the business stuff. I was on a, um, a dog on Zoom call about a week and a half ago. It was it was it was actually this month. It was August. It was like last. Actually, the first what it was. It was the first last Tuesday, actually, last Tuesday evening with the church group that I've been working with for a few years. Of course, helping them, of course, market their business, create some events and all. Like I said, I love events, all this kind of stuff. And of course, they were asking me about my podcast. How did I start the podcast? Because they wanted to start one for their transitional housing program and their business. How, how can they start a TikTok so they can get their business out there? Because they know they see me doing it all the time and I'm getting likes and I'm getting all this um these folks coming to, I guess, to, to come to my page. Now I'm sitting up here like, okay, like I said, I don't know what's going on, but that's what it seems like the, with the marketing. And even though I'm just now learning how to, I, I guess I've always been marketing. Everybody always markets. When I ask for a data, when I ask for the, go, anything, that's, that is marketing actually. But like I said, definitely, I'm sitting up here like throughout the years, I've helped all these business owners and people that are trying to start businesses I don't know, with, with their businesses. And I'm sitting up here like, what in the world? I don't know. Like I said, I'm just loving the, like I said, the marketing and the sales and the business side. And like I said, this may become a thing for me. I don't know right now. It seems like to me, that's what's in my heart at this time. And that's what I may need to look, I guess, start transitioning towards. I guess I put it that way. But like I said, that's me talking today. But like I said, I definitely love events and this guerrilla marketing. This book that I'm reading, I'm like, this is a damn fucking breath, breath of fresh air, y'all. I'm like, oh my God, this is like blowing my mind. All the events that I want to set up, because when I was reading the book, I'm still, I'm like, I'm like halfway through the book. The book is like almost 400 some pages. I mean, now I'm all excited. <laughs> but like I said, reading through this book, I'm sitting up here like, oh my God, these are, because I've, I've, of course, this book, of course, but of course I've looked up like some different ideas about guerrilla marketing and things like that. And I'm like, okay, this is the stuff that I was actually trying to create in my event planning business that I never actually started. 
because of course at the time I was going through a breakup and we were having all kind of drama in the household. I couldn't even focus on the damn business. I actually went to Grace Hill business, women in business classes for a whole month or two, learning how to do business, do all this kind of stuff. And I didn't even set the business up. Cause like I said, I was going through a breakup and I've been with this person for a seven, well, almost seven and a half years at that time. It was just crazy that's going on in my household. Had a goddaughter stand there, and I'll tell y'all about that at another point. It was just all kind of craziness going on, gossiping, just, just craziness, and I could not focus on the damn business. So I just kept working, kept working, doing what I was doing with my job until I can, of course, get fresh air and, of course, have a time to, of course, get out of survival mode in order to, of course, start a business and actually think about what I wanted to do with business. Like I said, that in like the last year and a half, two years, I couldn't even take a breather. Like I said, I'm, 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 I'm thinking about things now. And like I said, I'm really loving all this marketing and all this kind of stuff. Cause I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, okay, I've been, I, I love to do these type of events. I can't tell y'all what all of them were without, cause I have a whole notebook that I wrote down all this business stuff. As far as my event planning business went that I still want to start. I guess I put it that way as well. And by the time I finish reading this book, I may just go ahead and start that business actually. Cause like I said, I've been doing events for, since I was, I'm 44, almost 45. So back in my like late teens, since my late teens actually, because I've been, like I said, I've always been the one who wants to gather folks and do these events and do these Halloween parties. And I've done weddings, I've done bachelorette parties, I've hired strippers, I've done all the, all the whole thing. I have tried to schedule travel for my family as far as a cruise go. But they're so scared to get on a damn cruise. I'm like, y'all need to get out here and live. But like I said, I love, I've, I've always loved planning and coordinating. I've always loved that. The job I was at before I came to this home health care company now, I was working for a shelter for single moms and their kids. And of course I did, I, for that was like over a little bit over 10 years actually. And I planned all their events, their yearly barbecues, all the um, life skills classes. I had all types of career days that I created, my, just all this types of stuff, y'all. And I'm like, I have no idea why I'm not even in business doing events. And people have actually asked me that. Like I said, I've done all types of parties. I love just doing parties and bringing folks together. Recently, actually, I was looking at a podcast on YouTube, and they were talking about how they set up, I guess, like their own event space and how they're doing their, their own events and all this kind of stuff. And I, I was actually looking for an event space, I guess, like the last month or two, two months before my car broke down now i have another car that i can ride around and actually look for something and i'm like okay i can do that because i've been doing this for years and like i said some of the events weren't always fun parties but some of them were of course like i said the life skills classes for the young ladies making sure that i had instructors coming and they all did this for free like i said i know the, the group that i was working with were single moms who did not come from an environment like, like similar to mine actually drug usage gang usage nobody that's actually inspiring in any type of good way i guess i put it that way no business mindset no anything like that but like i said i still persevered through it anyway a lot of these young ladies could not and did, did not did not know how to do so so like i said some of the events were actually um, career days that I set up. I contacted um, about 50, 60 black women who own businesses, their own business, not just employees. I didn't want any employees, but people who own businesses were DJs in, in this area, were doctors, all types of stuff. Y'all had their own businesses, had them come out uh, several times actually to do like different Saturday like black career events for these young ladies. Like I said, they greatly enjoyed that. They said they got a lot out of it. Some awesome relationships was, was built out of that as well. Like I said, I have always loved doing things like that. Not just for myself, just but just for people in general. Like I said, to give them, like I said, I gave them girls a different experience and, and different outlook on life. And they, of course, appreciated that. Even though that they, they, they did not want to get up at 8 o'clock in the morning, to, I guess, to come down and see these people talk. But they got their butts up, came down, and they and they said they regret that, 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 that they had gave us a hard time. Not wanting it up, not wanting to come down, that kind of thing. But like I said, once they got down, they said they were mind blown. Many of them did. Some of them were crying by the time these events ended because they didn't realize that they could do these things in life or whatever it was. They they had relationships with these people as well. Like I said, it was just awesome events. And like I said, I love doing stuff like that. And I'm just like, oh my God, Like I'm, I'm now I'm all excited. I haven't even talked about relationships anymore. But, but like I said, I definitely want to. I'm looking more into, and I've been journaling about lately, about like i say about events and marketing and that kind of thing because i would I, I would love to do something in this area and like i said as more as more as i'm learning business as i'm learning these skills and as i'm talking to other people about business and that kind of thing because that's what they've been contacting me for i, I guess they see me doing i guess something in business they haven't seen is what it sounds like i'm like okay i'm just doing what i'm thinking is right and that kind of thing on tiktok the podcast posting my stuff and they all you getting awareness about this and you have a different mindset of how you're doing these things 
Now I'm like, I'm just doing these things like I think business should be going. I guess ran, I guess I put it that way. But like I said, to say all that, I need to move on to the next thing, y'all, because I'm way past it. I haven't even chose the topic yet. I need to get some water, y'all, because I can talk myself to death. <laughs> But like I said, definitely, I'm definitely going back and forth between this because I'm loving this, y'all. But let me go ahead and move on to the next. And I'm sure there's, before I move on, I'm sure there's some people out there that can identify who may have started in one field, one career, that kind of thing. But then as they learn business, as they learn how to do things, they, they, they transition into something else. And I have actually heard a few um, business coaches, um, let me see, about three or four in the last like year, talk about how they were in relationships, talking about relationships and Love and all this kind of stuff and sex and transition on into business because they, of course, like that better. And like I said, that's where I can see myself doing that as well because I'm loving the business side. I never knew it growing up. I never knew it until like the last few years as I'm teaching myself these skills. But I'm like, this is like mind blowing to me, y'all. Like I said, I know there's other folks out there who may have the same type of um, thing happen to them. If so, I want to hear from y'all. Please talk about them in the comments, y'all, because I definitely want to hear from y'all. So let me move my butt on, y'all. Okay, so, so I have one more thing before I get into the actual episode tonight. Um, yesterday, me and my partner, we like I, I think I may have told y'all, we actually created our own little um, couples business, I guess you would say. It was, it's, it's, I mean, it is kind of fun, actually. It's called Couple With Soul, and we're actually over on Facebook. We have a little Facebook page set up and that kind of thing as well. But we're called Couple With Soul. And, of course, we're going around reviewing different restaurants and eating food and that kind of thing and showing you all our experiences and even cooking. Because we, 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 he and I love to cook homemade stuff, and he has a lot more things that he knows how to cook than I do, so I'm learning as well. But I'm more skilled. He's more skilled in, like, cooking, like, seafood and, like, the traditional, like, southern food, Louisiana-style food, because that's where his family's from. And I love cooking in the crock pot. And doing casseroles. So, like I said, this is an awesome combination, y'all. We need to have a restaurant business as well, it sounds like. But like I said, definitely, we, we, last night we actually went to IHOP for a quick meal before we came home. And it was a crazy experience, y'all. Of course, we, had, we, 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 we actually walked in, of course. They had, um, I guess, the radio playing. It was like rap music and stuff like that, which I didn't mind. I mean, I don't listen to all the rap music at all anymore. But, I, of course, I, I mean, I, I know what the songs are. Some of it I still know. But like I said, I'm, I'm more listening to like, the Christian rap now. But like I said, it was like regular rap music on. Uh, I forgot Gucci Man was playing when we came in. It was other people playing. I don't know what which station that they were listening to, whichever station it was here in St. Louis that plays rap music. Um, like I said, it, it was on the whole time we, we were sitting there. But um, there was a couple that came in, a woman, a white woman husband and their son. He was about 10, 12 years old. And the lady, I guess, before she even got her order in, was all upset about the music. I think Megan Thee Stallion was actually on. It, it, of course, it was edited. It was on the radio, of course. But she was so upset. My partner saw some of this happen. I heard it, but I didn't turn around to see. But I'm like, what is going on? All I heard was pussy popping something. And this lady was upset about how this, she don't want her family or her son listening to no pussy popping music and no goddamn ad hop and um, this ain't no fuck. Well, she ain't say fucking, but that's my word. But this ain't no damn nightclub, and this ain't no club up in here. This is a family restaurant. She's going off on on the staff, and the staff was predominantly minorities, black and Hispanic. There was a white woman that was in there working as well. She didn't have an issue with it. <clears throat> Let me get some more water, y'all. But like I said, it was just a whole to do. She jumped up, flew out the damn door. Come on, get the hell. Let's get the hell up out of here. This pussy popping. She just she was just going on on on. And I'm sitting up here like, okay, if you didn't like the music, all you had to do was say it in a nice way to one of the staff. Can y'all please turn it down a little bit? I have my son in here. You didn't have to get disrespectful and irate and all these things. And we were just like, what the hell happened? <laughs> I'm sure she'll call corporate. That, that's fine. I'm sure on the store. But I'm just like, that's not the point. My thing is be respectful who you're talking to. I heard this when I, not, not, I, I can't say a lot, but I've heard these kind of things throughout the past when it came to black music or black anything, white folks seem to have a problem with it. But the next year or two, her, they come with the same damn fad and our shit looked look like it was just made up in the past and we didn't do a good job at it. But then now here, here, here come everybody else and they've overtaken our whole entire trend. But like I said, I was just very, very disrespected by what she did. I mean, I'm sure the staff was too because they were like, what the hell? We can change the station. All you do is ask us nicely. She just hollering and yelling at these people. Just I'm just ridiculous and irate. And like I said, that, was, that wasn't even called for. If you heard the music coming in, all you had to do was walk your ass back outside and go somewhere else and eat. And I understand. My saying that I know it's a family restaurant. I understand that. But there was only a few people in there. I'm like, okay, just if you have a problem with the music, just respectfully tell the people just to turn it down or something, anything. You don't have to go off on folks. And I'm, like I said, I took me and my partner did take offense to that. 
That's not the first time, like I said, you've heard white folks go off on our whatever it was, but then here they come the next few years, a few months, having the same trend like, like our braids and all the uh, fat asses and all this types of stuff, big lips and whatever the hell else they want to say. But now when, when white folks get it, it's all of a sudden trendy, it's all of a sudden nice, and they're getting billions of dollars for these concepts. When it was our shit that, that they stole from us, that pisses me off. And like I said, I know maybe y'all see it a different way than I do. I see it this way because I've experienced these. I've been called niggers by white folks and all types of stuff. And like I said, this, this, that, that definitely took me back to those times. And I'm like, all this lady had to do was just respectfully tell the staff. Instead of getting hollering, yelling, getting all upset, fucking flying out the door, all this crazy stuff. And her husband and the kid ain't saying nothing. I'm sure that all of them got some, some type of social media, Facebook, TikTok, somewhere they had, they had that, that they have heard that music before. I'm sure. I'm sure at least their son, I'm sure, have heard that music as well. Because I'm damn for sure he probably has a TikTok or on Instagram or some Snapchat somewhere else. All that stuff is across those, 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 those um, social media channels. There was no reason to, which I understand what she was saying. I understand that to, of course, have respectful music and that kind of thing. But like I said, there was a white lady working there as well. She didn't say anything about the music. And there was a man sitting behind us because when we actually first came in, the, it, it was another white couple with their kids and they didn't say anything about the music either. They had just finished up eating and they went back to the, to the table behind us. It was a white guy sitting back there. He was a minister trying to study and that kind of thing. Was back there reading the Bible, was saying that he was in seminary school. He was sitting there through this entire process didn't, and had not complained about the music at all. This is a white man that's in Bible school, that's reading the Bible, since sitting there IHOP. He said nothing about the music was, I guess it wasn't, it wasn't, was not disrespectful to him. So I'm like, okay, what in the world was going on? Maybe her husband slept with somebody, had a fat ass or looked like Megan Thee Stallion. I have no idea what was going on. Something happened to her. That either some, some, something had happened, to, maybe she's jealous that she ain't got a fat ass like Megan Thee Stallion. I have no idea. I don't care for her either. I mean, I've heard the music that she has and respect what she does. But I'm like, I don't listen to it either. So I'm like, okay, I'm not that offended. I can care less about it. Eat my food. and I'm, I'm hungry. I ain't got time for all that. I'm trying to eat my food and go ahead and go. But I'm like, okay, if, if Rizzo did not take all that. Like I said, we, we, we both, of course, talked about that and did, and did like a little video last night. Cracking up laughing actually about the situation. But I'm just like, this is ridiculous. Um, but like I said, that was just very, very disrespectful, I thought. Like I said, she could have definitely did that in, in a different way. I guess I put it that way. So, that's all the shenanigans. I've taken like 40-something minutes, y'all. But, but let me go ahead, and, I guess, into choosing the actual episode topic for tonight. And I got this little handy-dandy. I made this out of like an old um, Kleenex box that I'm shaking up, that y'all see. I put all these little slips of paper in here, y'all, that have all these topics on them. And I'm doing this on video so y'all can't see it on the podcast. But just imagine a little Kleenex box that's polka dotted in blue that have all these little slips of paper in it. They have different topics on them. So from, from now on, I'll be choosing one of these topics out of this box. And whatever it is, I'll be talking to y'all about it on the podcast. So let me go ahead and choose one for today, y'all. Even though I haven't talked a whole lot about everything else. But let me go ahead and choose one, y'all. Um, well, this is something totally different than, than, than what we have talking about, y'all. But this is actually talking about, um, this is how a parent can fight foster care. Kids back because I was actually working in the foster care system for seven and a half years for the children's division here in St. Louis City. And of course, I get the foster care case management, like I said, most years ago. Um, with the state, and of course, working with the family court and that kind of thing as well. But parents that's out there going through these kind of things, I may not be able to tell this in the whole 40 other minutes and that kind of thing, but just keep in mind that there are ways that you can fight to get your kids back from foster care. So just depending on what's going on in your case, I guess I have no idea what you all cases out there are like or or what the labs are like or anything else. And I'll expand on this more in, in, in another episode. I'm, I'm going to put this back in the box so I can expand on this more, actually. But like I said, parents out there just remember when you're talking about state that when there's abuse or, or neglect inside those cases or that the demon is inside those cases and, of course, your, your child ha or children have to be removed from, from your care and placed into foster care, there's always a way for you to get your kids back. I don't care what they tell you, what the caseworker has told you. I did that case work for almost eight years, y'all, so I know exactly what's going on. I can't say for every single state, every single place, St. Louis, Missouri is probably different from y'all cities and states, I'm sure. I may have a few different laws that I don't know about. But just keep in mind that all, all foster care case management, well, all foster care cases, they all have 
of course, the court order that comes out of that. You have to make sure that you're showing up at court, of course, speaking your peace and speaking your truth about whatever happened, what's going on, and what you can possibly do to get your kids back. Usually from the, from the cases I've had, there's parenting classes on there, sometimes anger management, sometimes getting better housing or whatever it is, if they have bad bugs or whatever's going on, cleaning up the house, whatever the situation was, getting a job to support those kids or income to support those kids with a business or whatever you're doing. Like I said, there's always things on there. Of course, we have to have supervised visits all those types of things but just keep in mind that, that the things that you can control getting off drugs stop drinking alcohol not having the abuser around the kids anymore especially if it was sexually abused because I've had cases like that as well where kids were sexually abused and the mother or the whoever the abuse was the mother not refusing to of course have this person leave out of her house and the kids cannot return with the sexual abuser in the household which I didn't understand but parents do that a lot actually um well, I can't say a lot. In the cases I had, they did it a lot. I guess I put it that way. And that's why some of the kids I had could not go back home. So, I, of course, I had to find out the family, that kind of thing. I know most of the case workers, of course, may not have any idea. Well, we're supposed to look at family first. I guess I put it that way. And that was always my motto. Look at families first. Look at who their neighbors were, their families, their friends, that kind of thing. Whoever this kid wants to go to, try to find these folks and, and get their house licensed. That's what I did. I, m majority of my cases, that's what happened in at least 95% of those cases. Unless those kids d did not want to go to the whoever it was, want to get their own apartment or that kind of thing. I, I did have a few of those. And I also had a few of those who actually went to jail for robbery and um on on criminal action and all these types of things as well, which I couldn't do anything about that. That was their action. They were old enough to me to know right from wrong. I guess they chose to just do their own thing and think it was the right thing. A lot of lost kids, I guess I put it that way as well, which that's another whole nother video. But like I said, parents, just remember when you all have a court order that's telling you what you have to get done in order to get your kids back, you can always do those things. There's all types of services either in St. Louis, St. Louis County, or whatever the county that you live in are nowadays online because of COVID-19 that you can take for free usually, different different types of courses and classes. And like I said, don't listen to what these caseworkers are telling you about not, not being able to get your kids back and that kind of thing, unless you've sat there and let your kids linger in foster care for years and they've adopted them on and terminated your rights, you ain't been to court in years, and yes, that's gonna happen, especially if you're not caring about coming to court. Uh, these white folks, they don't know what they're talking about because I've heard some of my parents say it in the past, but of course those white folks are the ones who of course control your case. And if you're saying those types of things, that's how they're going to take it that you don't even want your kids back and they are and they are going to make a concurrent plan of finding that child a permanent home <clears throat> instead of let, letting them linger in foster care and stay in these foster homes going back and forth and all this kind of stuff they're, they're looking for permanency they're usually looking to i'm, a, I'm assuming most of the case workers I know I was. I can't. I can speak for myself. I'll just say I was. Was looking to return my the the kids that I had back home, or if not, or if they couldn't go back home because the parents didn't care or didn't want them or didn't want to get off the drugs or could have cared less about what the the abuser being in the home. Then of course I had to find other family. That's just what I did. A lot of them may not have done that. They found foster homes and adoptive homes and stuff like that. I was trying to get these kids back with family, somebody that they knew. That's just what I wanted for these kids. I, most of these kids were 95% of them were a actually African American. I'm not going to keep placing my African American kids with all these other families and other races and folks that they have no idea who they are. Yes, there's folks out there with good hearts. I understand that. They want to provide foster care and that kind of thing. I just wasn't having it for the kids, uh, if I can help it, for the kids that I had. Like I said, I was trying to get them back with family and friends, somebody that they knew, somebody that they can, of course, relate to, and somebody that they, of course, grew up with, that kind of thing, and that, of course, would take care of them in a better way. Because I've seen some kids in foster care still getting abused, still getting sexually abused, still getting mistreated, all those types of things. Like I said, I had to place my kids with somebody that they knew. Like I said, that was just my motto and just what I did. I cannot speak for everybody else, but like I said, that's just what I did, y'all. And like I said, that was definitely something to, of course, see these families and to know that there's other families out there that were other family friends and stuff like that that these kids could have went to. But instead, the caseworker never looked into any of those. I can't tell you how many cases I got where nobody even asked the kid about family, nobody even looked into their family, nobody looked past anything but the mother and father leaving these kids in foster care for years, y'all. There, I can't tell you how many cases I've had. There was even one case that I had, I can't mention the name, but there was one case that I had that pissed me the fuck off, y'all. I got this case, and this little girl, <clears throat> let me get some water, y'all. And this little girl was talking about going back to her mother, wanting to have visits with her mothers for years. 
trying to go back, wondering why anybody told her about her mom. Her mother had passed away several years before I even got that case. They didn't even tell this girl. They, 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 they didn't tell her a goddamn thing. I got the case and I, of course, made sure all that shit happened. You can't keep lying to, I, I'm not going to have you keep lying to anybody on my caseload or keeping the, the, these lies going. I'm not a liar. So like I said, yes, I found, look, look, look through her case file, found, found her sister to, of course, finally, I, I, I actually learned how to license homes. I learned how to like license, I guess, like the kinship homes and family homes and stuff like that and adoptive homes as well. So that, because I was like included in some of that STARS training, taught like a few of the classes with the instructors, that kind of thing as well. So I knew how to license homes. So I started, so I started, I started taking it for myself. Excuse me, y'all, to go ahead and make sure I'm licensing these homes. Now, and, and I licensed her sister's home for her to move into. She had her sister said she had no idea where her where her younger sister was. Hadn't heard from her in years. She see, she said she kept trying to call the court. Um, the caseworker, nobody would even reply, saying where she was, what's going on with her. Hadn't even had a visit in years. And like I said, this was unfortunate. This black family, I guess I put it that way. And like I said, when I read through the file and found all this stuff, I, I'm like, this is not going to fucking work for me. And like I said, I found her sister, talked to her sister, had a home visit with her, got her home license, got everything done within like two months maybe. Had this girl moving back into her sister's house, like I said, and, and they live happily ever after. Her sister had to explain to her, because I sat there with her, her first visit back. That her mother had passed away. What happened? Nobody even told this damn girl. I think she was like 11 or 12, 10, between, I think like 10, 11 or 12 years old. Nobody had even told her. Kept all this false hope. Oh, we'll, 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 we'll try to find her, reach out to her. When it said blatantly in the file that, that the mother had goddamn died. I'm like, what in the world would you keep lying to this girl for? Maybe they didn't go back and read it. I have no idea. But the person who fucking saw it should have should have told this girl the damn truth. I was so pissed off, y'all. I, I, I was very pissed off. I went and talked to my supervisor like I told her I'm finding this girl's family and she's going to be moving with her family soon. Oh, well, you don't want to say, I'm, I don't give a fuck what you say, lady. Y'all can't lie to this, to this damn black child. I know how that fucking feels to not even be told the truth about your parents or whatever else going on. I wasn't going to have her doing that and constantly living a goddamn lie until she's 18 years old and, and, and go out of foster care system. Then she's going to find out her mother passed away. What kind of shit is that? I don't, I don't do people like that. And like I said, I took it by myself to find that. I guess to find her family so her sister could explain what was going on, all those types of things to her. I haven't seen them, of course, since, of course, the case closed. I gave her, well, wrote the court and got, like, the court reports and that kind of thing to, of course, give her sister custody. And, 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 and as far as I know, they live happily ever after. Of course, she, she can still get services or resources if she need. I'm assuming from the foster care department or whoever, or whoever she wants to get it from if she just calls to ask. But like I said, I hadn't heard from her since, of course, everything went down. Um, and she, I guess since everything went down where, where her younger sister was placed with her, the home was fine. Everything worked out well. To my knowledge, I had to do supervised visits for a few months, of course, to make sure things were going well and like check on the family. I think it was twice a month, that kind of thing, which was fine. I developed a good relationship with her and the girl and that kind of thing as well. But I was so pissed off, y'all. That was the horriblest thing I have ever seen. Why would y'all keep lying to this little black child about her mother being alive and that she's going to reach out to her, but y'all hadn't heard from her? Instead of just telling her the truth and finding some family for her to stay with, this girl was way out in some fucking white folks' home in Mexico, Missouri, and all this, oh, somewhere King, by, by Kingdom City and all this old bullshit. I'm like, are you serious? This girl deserves to, to, to know what is going on and what happened with her family, with her mom. I was so upset, y'all. And like I said, that was the one of the things that pissed me off about that. And like I said, I know I kind of got off topic a little bit, y'all. But like I said, fighting to get these kids back in good homes and stuff like that, even their family's home, it all comes down to the caseworker that you have. Yes, parents, I guess if you're listening to this, yes, you do have to, of course, do your work as well. Making sure that you're going to like your drug classes or alcohol class, I don't know, whatever it is. That, that your court orders to do, finding housing, for, I guess, for the kids or getting furniture for the kids to sleep on, whatever it is. <clears throat> going to parenting classes, making sure that you're getting a job and, and pro I guess providing a good home for them. Yes, you have to do those things. Any, most parents have to, that I know of have to do that. But of course, anything else outside of that, having a good relationship with your foster care case manager is key, y'all. Let me get my water. Like I said, that is definitely key to your cases. I'm sure if I wasn't the good foster care case manager that I was, that and I just let these cases slip through, didn't even care, like I saw a lot of my coworkers doing. Like I said, you definitely would probably not, well, these families, I guess I put it that way, wouldn't have probably remained intact or got back intact. I guess I put it that way. I would have just been placing kids somewhere anywhere, doing all these things which some of the workers were doing. Everybody just did not know how to, how to do that kind of job, I guess I put it that way. 
even though they've been hired and that kind of thing. Like I said, that's at every single job that you have. But like I said, the key to your success in getting your kids back, of course, is you doing your work, parents. But also making sure that you're developing a good relationship with your case manager. Like I said, that's the person that is going to push everything forward for you or not push everything forward for you. Some of these case workers just may have nasty ass attitudes and may not even care about your family. Yes, some of them I've seen them come off like that back in the past. I can't say all of them, but I've seen a handful of them. I guess I put it that way. And a handful of them that make a course, which I've been hearing a lot lately because my partner actually is in... He works in like child care facilities and stuff like that. So he, of course, has to deal with some of these case managers and things like that as well. So, of course, he's seen some of these things and how they are ignorant and that kind of thing as well and don't care about these kids. And he's been trying to fight for some of these kids as well. The same thing I've been doing. And like I said, this is just ridiculous, y'all. There's no reason why parents should not know what's going on with these kids when they're in foster care. Like I said, the case manager controls that entire situation. They're the ones who write that court report to court to let them know whether they, of course, are okay with the kids going back home or you finished the parenting classes or whatever it was. Like I said, they're the key to all that. They're the key to you, of course, you getting your supervised visits with your kids and stuff like that. But parents, like I said, if you're not showing up, you're not showing the, showing the court that you care, trying to, of course, complete your... um. Um, your required tasks on, on your cake um, court order. If you're not showing up at court, <clears throat> you don't have a good reason somebody died, you were at work, you couldn't get off. Like I said, you're showing folks that you don't care. And yes, they're going to move on with, with, with other things in your case. They can't terminate your rights without you being there. Yes, I've done that because some of the parents did not want the kids back. Some of the parents were still strung out on drugs, living in crack houses. So I'm not sending the kid back to that kind of environment. Hell no. But like I said, I did have family to, of course, assist in those cases. Family and neighbors, actually. To, of course, assist in those cases. You have to build a whole community around these kids. And some folks weren't, of course, willing to do that, but I did. Like I said, that's the only way that I can see our, our children and our youth that was growing up in that foster care system that, that they can, of course, thrive. A lot of them had all types of issues, all types of things that happened, all types of racist things that happened as well in some of these counties that they were placed in. But like I said, we had to, of course, build, at least I tried to build as much as I could a community around these kids for when they did go back home, they had that support, or when they with the family or their friends or whoever it was, that they did have this uh, this tribe around them, that, that 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 they did have the services that they need. Like I said, that's just what I that's what I did for the kids that I had on my caseload. I cannot speak for everybody else, and I know damn well that there were some very ignorant ass caseworkers. I know that, and they and this still is from what I hear and what I see. I put it that way as well. And you know the state isn't always right taking your kids and that kind of thing, but you can fight for that. They give you an attorney when you go to court. Sometimes that attorney is working for, of course, the children's division or, who, or the court or whoever it is, but you have to speak your peace. You cannot just sit there in silence and suffer in silence. If you know your kids should be back home with you and you, they had no reason to take those kids out your home, talk to that damn attorney at court Don't, don't and, and speak your peace in front of the judge at court as well. Don't be ignorant. Don't be hollering, yelling, all this kind of stuff. Be respectful because they can, of course, put you out the courtroom and hold you in contempt, but you have to go with, with your facts in order and with your information in order as well. We have our hands. I'm holding the cell phone right now talking for this podcast. We have the world at our fingertips right now with these cell phones. There's no reason why you cannot look up what's going on in these cases. Not, we're not in a specific case, but what's going on with the laws and all those types of things, how you can get your kids back. Like I said, this is just a blanket statement. But like I said, you, you can find all types of information that you want online. You have to do your research. And like I said, if, if you know that you're right and your kids should not have been taken out your home for whatever reason, then fight against that. There's attorneys right now who have class action lawsuits against the foster care system in different states and stuff like that. I think Missouri, I don't know Missouri, if they started one here yet, but in other states they have. There are some kids who, who were taken illegally and things like that. Like I said, you have to fight for your rights, y'all. Y'all just can't sit there and just sit there and just do nothing. I know us black folks, is of course, 95, like I said, percent of the people that are in foster care are black. And no, I don't care what city and state you go into. Majority of them are, majority of those kids are black kids in foster care. But like I said, we sometimes tend to, of course, be fearful of the court and fearful of these systems and all this kind of stuff that's going on around us. But you have to learn to work with these systems. I'm not, I'm not talking about get over on the system, trying to get as much food stamps as you can or welfare that you can or try to get Section 8, trying to get over on these Section 8 folks. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about trying to, of course, get your kids back if that's what you want to see and do, but also learning the process and what's going on. Like I said, this will be continuing into another video because I actually would love to have my partner here talking about this with me because he has a background in this as well. But I guess and 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 has more research, of course, because he's still in that type of kind of business. 
on how these parents are getting their kids back, something and, and, and about the court hearings that, that's going on right now as well. But like I said, we cannot, as black people, cannot cower down to anybody in power or anybody in the, the state buildings or anybody in the DMV or anybody in wherever, I guess, in the court system. We cannot cower down and be all scared to go on and say stuff. Get up and get out, get up and go on and talk. I guess like, like well, I'm stuttering now. I'm all excited, y'all. Getting all passion now. I can't get the words out. But like I said, get up and go on there and tell them what you want. You cannot just sit there and be silent and, and, and don't know what to say. Look that shit up. Figure out what to say. Goddamn, you tell everybody else how, how you want to get fucked and what kind of food you want and section eight and all this kind of shit. Go on and talk about business. Get your stuff taken care of. Don't just sit up there and be, just 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 be silent because because you think these folks are gonna all these white folks always get over get over on us and that's all they want to see. Fuck that. You can get up get up and research the stuff yourself as well. I research all the time. Research it. The only thing research is just looking up different cases, looking up the foster care system to have that process work, y'all. That's all you need to do and know how to talk to folks, how to go on and ask questions. You ask anybody else questions. It's, just, it's the same exact thing. You, you let anybody else know what you want, I hope. It's the same exact thing. Just don't go in there hollering, yelling, all this kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of stuff because you have to take care of business. But like I said, definitely. Y'all, I think my thing just, just stopped on me. Oh, y'all, my podcast just ended, so I'll just keep on talking to y'all on this. Um, but like I said, definitely, when you're trying to do things like that in the foster care system, make sure that you, of course, like I said, speaking your truth. You don't have to go into these situations not knowing what's going on, y'all. Make sure that you all do that. So I'm going to end here because it's been over an hour, y'all. So with that, this is Tanetta from Taboo Conversations. I want to say thank you all for tuning in to this particular episode, which I talked about a lot in this episode. But the topic for the night was how do parents get their kids back when, when the kids have been put in, the, put in the foster care system. Like I said, this will continue on. Just keep that in mind. And we will have another video, hopefully, with, with, with my partner next time so he can talk about his experiences as well, y'all. So with that, I want to say thank you all for tuning in. Take care, y'all.